cliche portfolio presentation, like, hey, this is what we do, this is going to be cool. Um, I, hopefully, my goal here tonight is to convince you that I was once just like you. And then assuming you believe that, I'm going to totally mess with your head stuff. What I'm going to do is I'm going to try to help you, unless you're already mastered those, but I'm going to try to help you understand practices of how to interview, how to get the interview, when you're doing the interview, what are you looking for, basically how to get a job. Okay? Um, and before I go into that detail, I'm going to share some anecdotal stories of my trials and tribulations of trying to do the exact same thing. Um, and hopefully it's fun. Um, okay, so, um, I'm going to start with the boring part first. Um, let's see if this thing works. You guys hear me, Ari? Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, cool. <laughs> Normally we've got, you know, Devo playing with this right now, but I turned the sound off. So just here's who we are. Um, on our website, it goes way faster, and I had to slow it down for tonight just in case you guys were like coming out of a nap or something like that. <laughs> uh, but basically, we're, I'd like to say we're soup to nuts. We do everything. You know, we do design research. We do concept development. We do brand development. We do market research. When I say do market research, I've been on six continents doing research in various hospitals, in various fields of agriculture, to people's homes. Um, it's awesome. It's so much fun. Um, we've done products that enabled Felix Baumgartner to jump out of a, a balloon in space. We've enabled people to hear again that we're deaf for many years. We've helped enable the blind to see. Uh, we've changed crops in industries from a growth of 58% growth to 98% growth in a year. Like, we work on a lot of variety of products. Earlier tonight, took me out for dinner, and you were talking about music, and that. blocks product, you know, I was a junior here, and I'm going to date myself now, the web came out, and somebody was like, hey, we should do a website, but we did it as a group, so all 20 of us in the class, we each had one page, but we were all on the same side. And two weeks after it went live, I got this phone call. I'm like, oh, great, okay. They're like, hey, we really like your stuff. You should come down. I was like, okay. So I went and met with the president, the vice president of his company, in the Wells Fargo building down on Belmont Shore. And I go up the elevator, get off the floor, open the door, and there's literally just, there's nothing. There's like two beanbags. They're like, yeah, we just moved in. I'm like, okay. And so, and back then it was like, um, and I could do that there like 90 by 24 or whatever. And uh, so we started talking, we started talking about some of the, the, the research they had been doing in Chicago. They were software engineers and they wanted to get into really having an impact on a mind and developing logic and math. And what they found was is the software developers they were missing the window because the really ultimate time to affect a child's life and their brain development was between the ages of three months and like 32 months. You know, you give a three month old mouse, they're like, oh. <laughs> So they were like, so we've learned this about music, we've learned this about play, and so we had these topics of conversation. It was really cool. It was like, all right, all right, cool. And so the guy goes, how much are you an hour? I was like, uh, 16. All right. He wrote me a check. I'm like, what's this for? He's like, I want to buy two weeks of your time. I was like, what? Yeah. I'm like, what do you want me to do? I don't know. Something about what we just, I'm like, like a blue sky project? He's like, yeah. They netted $40 million. Yep. <laughs> it's 
aesthetically, it was my worst design ever. <laughs> but I came up with this thing that looked like a big loaf of bread. <clears throat> and it had five blocks in it. <coughs> and when I was a kid, I always played with blocks. And I had this idea about constructing music. If you play with blocks. Each block's got six sides. So we put these sensors on all six sides of each block. Five blocks, six sides. The permutation is over a million in this loaf of bread. And then you put this Atari cartridge in for Mozart. And the nine-month-old could just go click, 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 and each side, each block was colored, had a shape to it, a thing. It had logic. It taught them time. It was huge. It won awards all over the world for like 15 years. It was crazy. came back to us years later and I was at another I was actually in I was actually I wasn't in I wasn't a junior. <laughs> I was actually at a firm. And they tracked me down at this firm. Uh, and they were like, we want to do it again. I was like, what? We want to hit another home run thing. And uh, so we No blocks anymore, but it looked like it. You guys know what Simon Says is? Okay, classic toy Simon. This looked like Simon Says that was done in like the 90s. It was like kind of a more grip and stuff like that. And we put a piezo sensor in it. Okay, so the toy had these color buttons, but it wasn't Simon Says. It was just like you, could, you were setting up the toy. You are touching these big, giant jelly beans. You know? And uh, it might be in the book. But it had a piezo sensor in it. Okay, and a piezo sensor, you can use a piezo sensor for a bunch of different things. And you, can, you guys can go to Home Depot tonight and buy the pieces that you need to build a piezo sensor. But what we were doing with the piezo sensor is we were using it for a vibration tool. So you would put toy on the table. sensitivity knob so you could make it really sensitive for like it was on carpet. But what you could also do is you could put it on the floor. Dance. And it would create music based off of your dance. And everybody could dance. Everybody could do a beat. But 9-11 So that's a college story. So you've seen this already. Uh, okay, I'm just going to go through some case studies. There's really no importance of any of these. Um, Cali Audio. It's a. I've done work for a company called Harmon uh, JBL since 1995. Um, and in 1996, I designed a driver for them. Um, that they still use today. In fact, their entire line of drivers echoes the theme of the design of what this driver looks like, because uh, nobody had ever thought to do that. Um, eventually, they were bought out by Samsung, and uh, Samsung was like, are you an engineer? Are you an engineer? Are you an engineer? You're dead. You're gone. So the engineers left, and they formed this company. This is what's called a near field monitor set. So the box that the monitor is sitting on, the, that box in the back, is a subwoofer, and the two monitors in front are your studio monitors. Um, studio monitors are different than stereo speakers. They're stereo, but they're not influenced by color. 
it's it's all about what is the recording representative of. It's a clear and it's like I just want to hear the music. I don't want to hear the you know you want to what did the producers and the engineers and the musicians put together? That's what this is for. But this is for you don't want to affect other people in the room. You just want to be in your space. So it's like having headphones without headphones. Um, all right, I need to move along. Uh, USB memory stick for Chanel. Uh, juicers for uh, Bradshaw International, uh, which is also Good Cook and Belletti and what else other stuff. Um, smart dumbbells. I wish I was uh, Power supplies for uh, commercial lighting. Digital sound processor for uh, people with a, they would get a cochleostomy to get an implant that would communicate effectively to this digital sound processor back and forth and it would enable a deaf person to hear. Um, if you've ever been in a doctor's office when that baby hears their mother's voice for the first time, that is something. <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, this is a goofy product. The guy literally wanted a schmoo where you can play all these goofy sounds, but you could record your own voice and then play it through these goofy sounds. And what he would, he's a firefighter that wanted to raise money for cancer children in certain cancer hospitals so that they could have laughter and play. And so we donated our time to develop this product for them. Um, and he would sell it to the hospital, but the proceeds would then go back into the foundation to support cancer. Um, yeah, this was a prototype that did not fit in the office. Um, <laughs> yeah. <that's good>. um, <laughs> uh, uh, ranges. Uh, we've done work for a man out in tag Whirlpool, Wolf, Blue Star, uh, Angie is an entrepreneur, did branding, packaging, the product design. Uh, don't do drugs. Uh, this is uh, vaping, packaging, ID design, branding. Um, uh, geez, this is inspection equipment. So you buy a Diet Coke, you buy a Bud Light. That can travel 70 miles an hour through this piece of equipment and was scanned individually to make sure it didn't have glass fragments in it. It didn't have a piece of pistachio in it or something like that. Um, we designed all their new equipment. We did all of their branding. We did their brochures. We did their front elevation of their building. We did their sales studio. We did their entry studio. Um, yeah, uh, we've done a lot of app design. We've done, yeah, a lot of UI. Uh, I'm just going to keep cruising through the. We broke the internet one day. Um, so this had never been. Oh, I screwed that up. So this had never been done. It's a technical term. Um, it's done closely today by IKEA, but not quite the same. You want to buy a product. Now this company called Floriflex, we've developed roughly 2,300 products for them. They sell in the agricultural business. They sell in the agricultural and the interior agricultural business. Um, don't do drugs. They sell products. They sell the picks and shovels for the marijuana industry. Okay. They sell to the big growers. And you don't buy one pick. You buy a thousand picks. You buy a thousand buckets. You buy the plumbing system. You buy. So what we developed was a way where the buyer could go online and go through setting up their grow space. I'm going to grow 500 tomatoes over there. I'm going to grow 300 figs over here. And I'm going to grow a thousand apricots over here. And they would go through this experience. Um, online of setting up their grow space. And the, the magic of it was, is we developed a way that they would go in and they would literally design their room or tell 
the application, what their room was online. And then as they did that, they started building out how they wanted to grow. I want to use these size tables. I want to use these types of buckets. I want to use this kind of plumbing. I want to do the thing. And then at the end of it, it would show you a 2D representation of a map of your new grow space. And then with a click of a button, you could literally travel through your space. You just built it all in line. Okay. And then without leaving that page, you could click the buy button. This launched on Amazon, and we broke it. <laughs> so we had to work with Amazon for four weeks, fixing and getting Amazon servers back up online. Um, but that's what we do. You know, we push those envelopes with things. I came here a long time ago, and you guys are so fortunate. Maybe not tonight, but other nights with the professionals that come in here. The professionals that come in here are amazing. I was here my first professional night. A guy by the name of Chuck Pelly came in here. He started this firm called DesignWorks. I had never heard of it before. And his approach was like, yep, we can do it. But he said no to it. Any, like he said yes to everything. You know, you go to Santa Monica, those lifeguard towers, he did those. 1977 Toyota Celica GT, that was design works. It had never been done before. Japan had never crossed the Pacific for services for America. He didn't even take a fee up front. She had a little scuff. And I was like, was such a like you know attitude. I was like, oh, this is really cool. Um, all right, so I don't want to spend all night on our portfolio, but there's like probably four thousand slides here. You know, there's a reason why I'm saying that. There's not four thousand slides, but I mean, I'm gonna go rapid fire in terms of like stuff we've done in the audio space, stuff that we've done. Oh, that wanted to show you. So this is when you next time you're at the Staples Center, which is a crypto center. I mean, these are the big blown speakers. You know, thirty thousand watts going through these things, like, causing you deafness. Like cool. um, consumer electronics, video game consoles, uh, video consoles. table, chair, thingy, uh, yeah, brushes for the makeup industry, listening devices uh, for the hearing impaired, uh, yeah, how high, uh, housewares, not the pumpkin pie, but the trays, uh, garlic press, scissors, potato mashers, peelers, uh, dark food storage, mandolins, oh, mandolins, be careful of these things, these are things, every single designer in the office is like, how's this, ah, <laughs> television call. And uh, they were like, hey, we want you to be involved in this television show called uh, American Inventor. No. No, no, no. We want you to be involved in this television show called American Inventor. No. Wait, why are you saying no right away? I'm like, it's going to be a train. How do you know? I'm like, just no. Uh, and he was like, just like that. And then 20 minutes of back and forth. saying no. I said, no. I told you no last year. They're like, no, we fixed all the problems. <laughs> I told you last year the problems. <laughs> so, but at that time, I had a partner. Okay, maybe I should show this as a partner. So I turned to my partner and said, hey, American uh, ABC is calling us to like do a television show. He was like, well, you know, 
to check it out. I'm like, okay. <laughs> okay, a couple more rules. I swear, I have a really strong opinion, so I don't need to go back. So, we go to their studios uh, up in the valley, and uh, they bring us into this big auditorium, and they brought in 22 designers. We're the audience. Now, what we've just learned is the season, the season has already been rolling. It's been going on for months. And they've narrowed it down to the six finalists. And the six finalists are going to come up on stage and present to us their designs. And then what's supposed to happen, this is the BS part, what's supposed to happen is they're going to present, and then they're going to meander around all the design studios. already scripted and I didn't see it, but anyway. <coughs> so I'm not getting this in order. Uh, firefighter comes up. He's got this idea for the the ultimate Christmas ornament that goes to the top of the Christmas tree. It's an angel with a dress on. But unbeknownst for the audience, it's actually a fire sprinkler and it's got hose light going down the tree. And it's gonna go to a pressurized tank that the fire starts going to put out that fire. And I turn to my camera and I'm like, do you know how much water can you use to do that? Like, there's no way that you pull that off. That's the key. He's going to hide it disguise it as a gift. I mean, we're talking about 50 gallons. It's a big gift. So, <laughs> that was great. Another couple comes on and uh, they're cute. They put a Mr. Coffee maker on the table on the podium or whatever. And one of them had one of those uh, PVC 93 angle things for your sprinkler system. And they just held it up to it. And went, we want to make an adapter for a Mr. Coffee maker so that people can make their tea through it. And I'm like, Mr. Coffee maker doesn't get hot enough to make tea. You know. This other guy got up and he had this idea about making these. Uh, pre-made templates for a car, a plane, a helicopter, a boat. Um, it would be on a flat piece of paper. You'd download it, you'd print it out, you'd color it online or whatever you do, but it had instructions to turn it up and it'd be powered by rubber band and you know, and there we go. And we had done a lot of work for HP and Canon and I was like, man, if he pulls that off, that's going to be epic because brands like HP and Canon, what they need to do is they need to sell their brand at younger age. You know, a ten-year-old doesn't care about what the brand of printer is, but boy, if he's getting his motorized airplanes from HP, that's a big damn deal. His problem was he couldn't make his templates fly. He didn't know how to make a paper airplane. I was like, that was so stupid. I'm like, but that's a good idea. Somebody else came on. I'm not going to go into too much detail. She had an idea for a special pillow that would allow her to sleep on her chest. Just leave it at that. I was like, is that a thing? I don't know. Uh, somebody else, these two guys came up from Arkansas, Alabama. They were like, we got this idea about how to organize their aluminum foil, their wax paper, and some other roll of something, you know, under your, you know, cabinets or in your drawer or whatever, and I was like, yeah. and I looked at my partner, I was like, they choose us, you're running it. And just look at this already. And then these two guys got up there from MIT, and uh, they were, they had this concept for a bike hanger. story short, what happened? They did pick us. The guys from Alabama picked us, and the guys from MIT picked us. We got both projects. 
And I was like, oh, great. Who was the best client? Alabama, all the way. Alabama walked in the door the first day of shooting, and they were like, you guys know what you're doing? We'll see you in four weeks. And they were gone. And my engineering partner just had to develop it with nobody interrupting him, and he just broke and I had these two guys from MIT, and it turns out when you go to MIT, it doesn't mean you know shit. <laughs> and they were up in my business every other day, and I was like, oh my god, you guys. You... <sighs> so it was a headache. It was like, oh, that was a long time. All right, anyways, headphones for people with ears. Uh, headphones for people with ears. Uh, tennis ball, launching machine, uh, stepping devices. Mountain bike hangers. Uh, this is going to turn into a video that's not really all that many chips. I'm just going to stick forward. Uh, industrial design, um, television lighting. Uh, I can explain this. Uh, okay, funny story. Uh, it's another slide. Culver City based company doing uh, voiceover. over IP. You call, you don't get a person. What you end up getting is you get a back-end software that manages your voicemail into their Outlook system. Tony gets the message and goes, you should, Sam and Julie should be getting this. Fast forward, that goes into there. Okay. But they needed a box for the software to run on. So it was like a 3U box that goes into a rack, lives in a closet, never sees the light of day. It's in the telecommunications market. If you've ever been to City of Trade Show in Las Vegas, which you won't, you know, it's a two, three football fields of products that all are black, silver, black and gray, silver and black. I think I said that already. Anyways, whatever. So, but what was interesting was these guys had a specific bill of material. I was like, how am I for your enclosure? And the thing was, is we were going to build it for them. We're gonna, we were going to be responsible for the design and the manufacturing. So they were like, oh, that's easy. You know, the techno geek engineer was like, $19.37. Wow, that's very specific. <coughs> so we went back. story short, I go to the presentation from the VP on down, do the presentation, and the VP just comes over at the end of it, just like all, which of these concepts do you recommend fit in the $19.37 bill? This one, this one, this one, this one, that guy, but maybe with a little spice of that. Great. Gathers them up, still very cheap. We'll call you tomorrow. Cool. Next day, I'll I say, phone rings, I look at my phone, and it's a VP, and I'm like, hey, how's it going, Harry? Design. It's the CEO. <laughs> the CEO just goes, so tell me about the concepts I wasn't supposed to see. And I was like, oh, shit. I was like, well. So I started explaining them, and one of them included this display that went in the front and center. But I didn't know what to put on it. I just thought it would look cool. And I was like, black and silver sucks. You're at the trade show, and everybody's seen black and silver. And the trade show is black, so everything disappears. So I was like, make this thing emerald green or like lime, like make it so people like 50 feet away who've seen black all day and are walking on feet that are killing them to go, hey, what's that? <laughs> Anyways, two weeks later, the rendering is sitting in the program manager's office, and he calls me up, and he goes, do you know on the third line of the LCD screen it says Gucci handbags? And I was like, yeah. Why? I'm like, dude, it was 2 o'clock in the morning. 
I didn't know what to put down, and I just was goofing off. <laughs> so, it's like, okay, that makes sense. Um, okay, so fast forward, fast, oh, so what happened was, they built it, they sold it, and then we were in the middle of developing the consumer version, and Dell Computer bought the whole company. And they were gone. Uh, handheld device for detecting chemicals that you never, ever, ever want to be around. A uh, thermal imaging camera that you definitely want firefighters to have to save your life. Uh, thermal imaging camera to save uh, military personnel's lives in their tanks and their Humvees and their whatever. Um, so this was a personal project. Um, get into my hiring stuff. But in my hiring stuff, I left a particular firm and went to the dark side, went to the corporate side. Um, and I had, I had established a relationship with somebody on the corporate side already, but I went there anyways. And we ended up fostering this really wonderful relationship over the course of 24 years. And she called me up. Um, she called me up in 2020 about COVID, um, and uh, it's a big deal. So, and this is my opinion, I've been to various facilities in terms of doing studies in China, USC, UCLA, Boston, Mass, John Hopkins, but this room's fucked, <laughs> sorry. So it's got an HVA system in here, and the HVA system, you can spend it close to around $375,000 have the HVA system new COVID in the HVA. The problem is, I don't know, that guy who's looking at his computer in the back, he's got it. <coughs> what the HVA system does is it pushes it from one side of the room to the other. Everybody in that path is going to have it. Now, if you're in a classroom, you're in a 9-11 call center, you're in a conference room, you're in a restaurant. We've all got HVACs. This is the first ever patented tabletop 100% COVID killing device. 100%. We got it all the way to tooling. But the people that funded it were restaurant owners. And when Newsom pulled the plug on the restrictions, restaurant owners were no longer investing in it. <coughs> this happens. I had the vice president of marketing uh, for Sandus. You guys ever heard of Sandus? They're one of the largest memory manufacturers in the world. He called me up with an idea. He says, I got this idea. We're going to approach artists. them and go, look, what if we develop an experience on a USB stick, a SanDisk USB stick, that a concert goer can buy at the concert. They can get your library, they can plug it into their computer, get a special online experience, and oh, they're a part of the club. Sounds cool. My job was just to design these USB memory sticks. You know, like, do that in my sleep. I did stuff for Hulk. I did stuff for Clapton, I did stuff for Gwen Stefani, I did just kids going, you know. But they were all like, you know, it's expensive, you know. Whatever. And then one day he called me up. He goes, we're on. I said, what do you mean? He says, your artist wants to buy in. I'm like, really? He's like, yeah, the first order is two million. Two million devices. more than $60 an hour. <laughs> I was like, and on Thursday, Michael Jackson died. And the judge froze all of the assets, including the stuff that developed, being developed for this work. And when they finally flushed it out, they approved everything to proceed, but 98% of the proceeds had to go to the family. The family dug their own 
this uh, puts rheumatoid arthritis into remission. It works. When they first tested it, <laughs> so they had this select group. It was like 12 patients that went through the surgery and got this uh, uh, implant on the vagus nerve in the neck. And then this device programs the vagus nerve as well as you know, gives it power and communicates it to it, and then they take it off, and then they go about their daily business. This guy had been suffering from rheumatoid arthritis for like 20-something years. He hadn't done anything. And all of a sudden, one day he wakes up, and he's like, I feel great. And he decided to go play tennis. <laughs> and he was crippled for like two weeks, because he hadn't used any of those muscles. So they had to write a whole new protocol about like, you know, rehabbing them back to normal life. Um, it's a positive thing. Uh, oh, uh, this is uh, for implant of implant that goes back on the uh, greater occipital lobe, uh, but it's for people with migraine headaches. Um, EEG monitors, interface, all that, that new types of crutches, uh, spinal cord stimulators. Spinal cord stimulators. This is where people have chronic injuries and they cannot heal their pain. So they put these stimulators on your spine to match the pain. Okay? And it's called paresthesia. It's not anesthesia, it's called paresthesia. Okay? And literally, the surgery takes 14 hours. Okay? To put the electrodes onto the spinal cord takes about 45 minutes. But they have to program it using a console that has over 136 controls to get the paresthesia feel. Think of it like this. You've all had some sort of anesthesia, maybe? Dental, something like that. You're like, wow, that feels weird. Okay, that feeling is electrical. Okay, so no stabbing. Well, maybe there's a surgery. But it's electrical. But what happens is by turning on, 132 different knobs to make it move. Okay. The problem is, is it's like. There's like 13 hours of that. So, so I was like, give him a Game Boy. Let's just give him a Sony PlayStation controller. Take that big console out of their hands because the patient's awake. Just give it to them, and they're like steering it around. That's good. Okay, now change the amplitude. Oh, oh, oh. Now the surgery was done in two and a half hours. Operation theaters are rented. That surgeon rents the surgical room from the hospital. It saves tons of money, plus the agony of the patient. Okay, never mind. Uh, the, yeah, exciting stuff. Uh, toy. Oh, there's that loaf of bread I was telling you about. Uh, agriculture, uh, 2,000 plus products for this guy. Uh, this is actually a really cool product. Uh, stuff, but I won't go into it. Okay, so let's go into the topic tonight of. Um, uh, well, I know my desk, so. so I wanted to talk about how many of the. Uh, what do we got here? Is it all juniors? Is it seniors? Is it graduates? Is it. Yes. Okay. Um, how am I on time? You guys have time? Good. Yeah. I'm exhausting. No, no. Okay. Oh, there's a cat. Okay. Keep the, warm me the cat. Um, so I got a job here. I was working for the school. Uh, somebody tapped me on the shoulder and was like, go control the bandsaws. Okay. You know, and then shortly after that, go teach these kids how to do renderings. Go teach these kids how to do prescriptions. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, alias, you guys probably don't know Alias, but Alias is coming up as a big software program. Um, not only that, but it was started on the Macintosh. And back then, we had the slowest Macintosh in the planet. <laughs> Christmas was about RAM. You know, it was like, Mom, all I want is 12 megabytes of RAM. Really? It's all you want. Yeah, it's all But it's really expensive. <laughs> You know, but you know, you, you, you got it, you know. Uh, and we would do these crude, my crude, CAD models in Alias. Have you ever run Alias? Yeah. At any rate, Alias is a great service model. It probably still is today. I love that. I became a rocket scientist in that program, which is weird. But in the beginning, 
beginning, it was a struggle. And uh, at any rate, uh, there was a guy by the name of Joe Riccio. He used to feature her. Um, he talked furniture. He saw my stuff and was like, hey, you want to come work for me? Sure. You know, and he just hired me because I had these computer skills, right? Keep that in mind. So I went there and worked with him doing a lot of computer stuff and drank a ton of coffee. And after a while, that got boring. Um, I got somebody else here, a guy named Rob Westerkamp, um, came in the studio one day, one day and was like, hey, do you know anybody who likes audio stuff? I think I showed you like 40 slides, whatever. Um, I've been building audio devices ever since I was a kid. Um, well, when I was a kid, I was a record but later I don't know. Um, <coughs> So I ended up going to work for a company called uh, Lum Design Associates, or LDA, or whatever. Um, and uh, we did, basically my job was to make boxes look pretty, you know, and after a couple of years, you could do that in your sleep, you know, just, you'd wake up in the morning and be like, I got three ideas, you know, you'd just go in there like, oh, that's great, yeah, and like you just, it, it was, there was a formula to that, you know, and then you were like, I want more, I want more, I want more. Uh, but my dream job was to go work for this company called Hauser. Um, they don't exist anymore. Back in the day, um, they were a big to do. And I got to interview at this company, at this firm, six times over the course of three years. I just kept hunting. And it started when I talked to a professor here when I told him that my desire was to go work at this company. And he gave me a name. <coughs> and this guy's name was Ted Cruz. You want that? He's not there anymore. Huh? But I had his phone number. That was gold. That phone number was gold. I called him. It's like I was probably creepy. <laughs> I called him a lot. You know, and the studio guy was awesome. got you. He's like, who is this? <laughs> and I go through this diatribe of explaining who I was. And he's like, okay, I'm going to pass you off. You know, and then I was off to Rick Blanchard. And I was off to, you know, and then eventually I was interviewing with Steve Hauser, who was the owner of the firm. You know, and I was just like, oh, I'm going to interview with the owner of the firm. And then it was like, the interview I went on nine months later. And I was like, I interview with Steve. He's like, yeah, you don't interview with Steve. I'm like, what? <laughs> nah, Steve's kind of, you know, but he's the, oh, no. Oh. And kept doing this process, kept doing this process, and then one day I had multiple offers. One was from Hauser, one was from RKS, and one was from another firm. And I was like, what do we do? What do, we do? You know. But I ended up turning down the one at my dream job, which is used to do that. Um, and I took a different job and I went down a different path at RKS. Um, and what you have to start to build in your minds and in your portfolios, you have to start developing a methodology. Okay. Now, there's are there any juniors in here? Okay. All right. Cool. Um, I did not assign this presentation. I didn't say or to do that or do that, but I'm going to give you an opinion. You have to have confidence in your work, okay? You have to have confidence in your work such that you tell a story and a tale, and you've got to tell it quickly, okay? And technically, you should team up, meaning... You could experiment and tell your stories differently, or you could experiment and be bold together. I was once you. I'm not picking on anyone. But as I look at the displays, it's a massive amount of information. If you watch a movie, there was this person, it was called an editor. 
they edit the shit out of that movie. Okay? It's not about the quality of the movie. Well, it is. But it's about the marketability of the movie. You've got to edit your work. I was that guy. all my shit with me. And I go in there thinking it was all important. It's not. It's not important. What's important is that you open the door. You gotta open the door. You don't open the door by giving them every fucking page of the project. Uh-uh. No, 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 no. You gotta sell it. who like one day, we were all sketching a certain way. We were all doing this thing a certain way. And then one day he came to me and goes, I want you to do this. I want you to do this one project, but I want you to do it like this. Okay. Because he was God. <laughs> one project, floor to ceiling. My next project, in this very room, right over where the woman in the sweater with the striped horizontal, my project went through the ceiling. One project, not five, not three, not two, one project. When I get portfolio sent to me, which is three a day, you look but there are, there are designers that I'll entertain, like they'll, they'll push it. And the ones that push it, are, okay, all right, let's do it. Let's do a Zoom call. And um, what I'll ask them, I'll go, what do you want to hear? What do you want to hear? You know, if they're like, oh, good job. Okay, this is going to be a short conversation. But if they're looking for a critique, we can talk shop. Okay. Because one of the things that you have to do, and you can do this with each other, is literally brutally critique each other's work. It doesn't mean be mean. But all of you have got a really good project. And all of you have got a mid-level project. Maybe some of you have all great projects. Oh. But you need to go into your own portfolios and go, yeah, maybe this one's not so good. Don't show it. You ever go to a bad movie? The reviews suck. Why would you do that in an interview? And if, you're, if, it, if it's a passion project, respect it. Own it. Do it over. Do it right. Take your summer and dive in. Go for it. You know, when I was at my second firm, I knew I'd hit the ceiling. And I was like, I need to, I need to interview. And I went home and I was like digitally cataloging the portfolio. And I was going through it. And I was gave myself a date. I've got a year. I've got a year to be my own moonlighting company to get my portfolio up to speed. It ended up only taking nine months, but that's what I did. I told myself, and that's what I did at night. Maybe not every night, but I was redoing my portfolio. I was redoing that stuff. But when you send out a portfolio or you have a URL or you stuff up there. And if you got one good thing up there, great. One good thing. <clears throat> I was in London at Academy of Art doing student interviews and this student A single halogen bulb in a brick that you would charge your iPad on. Okay. And a single halogen bulb was pointed straight up. And it was plugged into a wall socket. And he had a peacock feather coming out of the stem and sitting over it. And the heat from the halogen bulb creates thermal. Well, 
play of the shadow across the ceiling and the wall is epic. Now what's important is it made you curious. And that's what you have to do with your interview. Don't go into your interviews with the Encyclopedia Britannica underneath your arms in terms of your portfolio and sit there and go through it. Somehow, I got a random door open for me to go interview at Frog Design. And it was an ordeal. You go there for the whole day. You fly up there, and you interview for like six hours. And they, you're in a room, and they just bring designers in, they bring program managers in, and eventually they bring a couple of VPs in. And it's all day. You're just, you're just doing your portfolio shit. This, this thing with frogs is really important to me. I thought it was. Going to work for Hartman Esslinger? Man, that would be global design. Oh my gosh. All day. Designs, designs. You know, it was getting really good. By the 3 o'clock, I was like, you know, I could put a tune to it. In walked this Japanese. Vice President of Design comes in. <coughs> Go through the thing. It's just quiet. Show him my stuff. Show him my stuff. It's just quiet. He's like touched one of my renderings at one point. Quiet. And then he said, thank you very much. And then the next person at the door was like, thank you for coming. That was it. That was the job. No. Six months later, somehow the door opened again. I was like, fuck it, I'm not like, flew up there again. All day long, doing the thing, you know. And then by 2 o'clock in the afternoon, who walks in? It's him again. <sighs> not that he's just not big of my portfolio at all. They made a change. The next person in the door didn't say thank you very much. They said, come with us. So they bring me into this conference room, and it's like the 10 VPs of Frog North America. And a guy by the name of Dan Harden. Dan Harden is the CEO of a Whipsaw Design up in San Francisco. Dan's a really nice guy. We've been friends for a long time. But Dan, at this point, doesn't know me a whole lot. I was here at Long Beach State. I was a junior at Long Beach State. I had taken a methodology class. I was really into coffee. And they said, pick a product, <coughs> break it down, do an analysis of it, practice your methodology, and redesign it. 1995. So I did. My model, my designs, <coughs> I was at Frog, and he was going through my portfolio. And I'm 23. Dan goes, you should patent this. And I'm like, oh, man, I just want a job. It's just a model that's getting old back in my closet, you know. No, no job. We <laughs> said, thank you. I mean, Dan at one point, he was like, how did he get here again? Like, he was like, what the, you know, same Japanese. <laughs> so now, fast forward, I've got the opportunity to go to my dream job, right? And I've interviewed there six times over the course of two and a half, whatever years I said. And then I get this other call to go to RKS and then another job. And so I do the, uh, I do the interviews at Hauser. And by now, like, we know each other, because I've been there six times. And then I go to Arcas. And Arcas, I got an interview with three VPs and the CEO. CEO. Carrie Chow. Lance Hussey. Jeff. 
Japanese store. <laughs> I'm like, oh, you've got to be kidding me. I'm like, hey. Oh. So I left that day going, best I got three S's and for sure I got a no. Come back. And then I got a call back. I went back again. forward to now. Hiro Taranishi works for me. <laughs> and he was the guy that didn't like myself. Um, and we've been friends for a very, very, very long time. But he pushed <coughs> me. He pushed all of us hard. And that's what's important about interviewing. What's important about interviewing is remembering this. They need somebody, but you need to find a firm that you want to work for. You need to find a firm that's going to make you grow. Okay, You're going to come out of here with a bunch of utility skills, but maybe you've got visions. Maybe you just like utility skills. It doesn't matter. Find a firm that matches that id, that ego, that thing that's going to satisfy you. <clears throat> I took a job to take a job. Mm -hmm. right. He's hiring me because of my CAD skills. And I never want to be a CAD operator. But, fuck it. You know, I get to go say, hey, you did something for me. But then that had value. Okay? Because it said something for my next one. So, yeah, that's legit. You know? Um, but, yeah, the interview is your interview as well. When you're interviewing, get into a company and you're talking to the head of operations, you're talking to the wrong guy. But he might be able to get you in the door. You want to talk to a design manager. You want to talk to a program manager. If you talk to a senior designer in a firm of 50 people, he's not the decision maker. But he knows somebody. So always remember, anytime you got a phone number, it's a pyramid scheme. It's your pyramid scheme. you got to work it for the next three numbers. Even if that guy says no, because if you call and say, hey, can I get a job? No. You fucked up with the question. You gotta start with how do I get a job? How do I get an interview? Oh, well, I'm not the guy to talk to. Well, who do I talk to? You gotta talk to Rita. She's in HR. Why HR? Well, Rita knows the managers that, oh, what are their names? Get names. It's a number and name collection system. You're not a designer. You're your own marketing department. Okay? Just work the system. Because the fact of the matter is, is you're going to get 40 to 50 no's before you get a yes. Okay? And it'll be exhausting. Right? <laughs> you've done now, I'm like dating, but we'll do it like that. Okay? Just not as crazy. Um, and if you get somebody on the phone that's a decision maker, just remember that the poisonous question is, for sure, can I get a job? Second below that is, can I get an interview? What you have to do is you have to ease the door open. I mean, you knock yourself out, you can blast that door open. But think of yourself as a reporter. You want to do an informative interview. You want to get that person to do on the other end of the phone and say yes. Can I get a job? No. Can I get an interview? So much shit on my plate. I had to drive an hour and 40 minutes just to get here tonight. You know, like I'm not doing this next week. Like, that's a no. Okay. What you want to do is you want to get them to say yes. So ask them for an informative thing. Like, I just want to learn about your company. Because guess what? They love. They love talking about themselves. Okay. All right. The other thing you need to do is you need to, any of you guys insecure about talking on a phone? Anybody insecure about talking in Zoom? Zoom. Zoom's a game changer. <clears throat> this is an old trick. It's, it's before 
Zoom, there was mirrors. But with Zoom, there's video. And it's really important. Make sure you're on camera if you're on a Zoom interview. Okay? Make sure you're on camera. And make sure you're looking at yourself on camera. Okay? It's the same thing. If you get a phone call, you run to your bathroom. You run to your bedroom with the tall mirror, and you do the interview in front of the mirror. Because you get in front of the mirror, and you're like, but it changes how you smile. It changes your intonation. It changes how you talk, okay? Versus the, you know, uh-huh. No, I'm totally into that. I love that stuff. You can hear that through the phone. And believe me, I've been doing this a lot. I'm done. Okay. So you need to practice that. The other thing is, is now, let's say they've accepted the informative interview. It's totally okay to bring your portfolio. Okay. But remember, you gotta bring it in levels. Thank God for the digital age. But you want to be able to. Let them look on a screen for two tops, okay? And don't put anything that sucks. Okay. Then you can have a meter. You can measure how the interview is going, okay? You literally can put a meter right there on the table. What's well, in your head, okay? If you're doing all the talking, you're done. You're not getting you're not there to do that. You're the marketing person. Your job is to get them talking. It's an informative interview. Get them talking about their shit. They love talking about their shit. Get them in a good mood. Get them smiling. Get them in a happy place. Wake up. Okay? Remember that. That's been my experience. Hey, hey. That's the reality of this, okay? Um, edit your sites, have somebody else look at your sites. The informative interview is really important. I'm gonna get a lot of emails in the next couple weeks, probably from this place. I'll offer an informative interview, we can do it online, I'll take a look at your stuff, but I'm gonna be honest, okay? I'm not gonna repeat what Herb Turnhour said to me. But his point was, if we tell each other your stuff looks great, you didn't learn it. But it doesn't mean to tell you that your stuff sucks. It just means to be honest. <coughs> okay. All right. The other thing that I think is a value add that you need to afford yourself to do is to get out of Long Beach. You need to leave this place at least once every three months. You need to go to another university. You need to go to another design studio. You need to go someplace. I walked around this room. Um, I saw a portfolio over there and another one over there. stuff that was happening that was going on there. Um, there are some shoes in here. There's some soft goods in here. There's some computer projects in here. There's some transportation projects in here. Um, there was a, <laughs> I like the shotgun shell volume knob. I thought that was a cracker. Um, be true to what you're into. Be totally true to what you're into. Follow it. Don't feel like you have to fit what, you know, the room says you need to do. No. I, when I was here, you know, I remember for students that wanted to go into film, you know, they wanted to do <coughs> special effects, and they wanted to do, you know, like, whatever. You know, like just, that, 
was it my music? That was their music. You know, you know, one of my good friends was like, "Why do you read me, read me this shoes?" And I was like, "I was an idiot. Like I didn't know it was allowed to, be, to shoot." <laughs> but I mean, he's like head of design of Adidas. You know, he loves. I'm like, go pursue that. You know, do what you want to do. You know. Um, and the other thing is, is the informative interview process, you guys do a thing here where you invite the pro professionals to come here and critique the work. The other thing is, is I would flip that around if you're not already doing it. I would go to the professionals and say, okay, you don't need them to come here. You can, but what I would do is, is I would, Challenge yourself to go find a mentor. Call these firms. Look at ID magazines. I don't know if ID magazines still around, but you know, look at some of the firms that you like. Pick some of them and say, "Hey, I'm, I'm looking for a mentor. Can I, you know, four times this semester show you my works and get a critique and do the stuff here, here, and here? Show them how responsible you are at managing your time. Show them how responsible." You meeting your own deadlines. Show them how responsible you are at communicating efficiently and effectively in front of them. You've already set up an interview. And you're getting professional guidance on school projects at the same time. So try to get mentorships. Find people outside of the building rather than trying to get them here because LA traffic sucks. Okay, you're the student. We've done a variety of projects. Um, when I was working on yeah, speakers, speakers were cool. Um, there's there's a lot to it, and it, it has to do with um, working with engineering, working with marketing, working with people that are responsible for doing purchasing. What's the cost? What's the bottom line? How many units are going to be sold? Um, I, uh, yeah. somebody else designed at the office designed this, so I'm going to go back in time. Where is it? Well, this isn't a good version of it, but I'm going to use it. Um, right? Uh, This is a twelve thousand dollars studio. Um, we were doing this project. This isn't totally complete. The grill. The, there's a grill that normally would be in front of us. Um, so this is standing in what's called an anechoic chamber. I don't know if you've ever been in an anechoic chamber, but it's a chamber that absorbs all sound. It's like being in space, I imagine. It's like you just hear nothing. Nothing. You you can't hear that. It got absorbed. They're testing the speaker. Okay. Alright. So JDL happened to be like it was sort of like behind the scenes known in the market. They were really known for like not only good acoustics, but their bass. job was design a box. I get picked on for this. You mentioned this at the office, no all laugh. Or you need to spend all sincerity. But that little logo badge. I talked them into making it out of rose gold.
vice president of marketing got fired. Because he was against it. He was so against it, he punched one of the program managers in the face. It was immediate grounds for firing. But he was so against going outside of the box As a designer, you've heard this before. You have to go too far to, you, to find gravity. Well, okay, back it up. Let's put some wheels on it. That's easy to do. The problem is, if you only got to the wheels part, is what if they did know about the find gravity? You gotta go far. Surfacing, you do a texture. One of my early medical device projects was uh, deep brain stimulation. Um, it was treating patients for brain injuries and pain in the uh, skull and stuff like that. And they wanted us to develop an inductive charger for the implants. They're like, what? How do you do that? Where are the implants? Sent us a tape. Me and this other designer from Europe, <laughs> we went at the conference and play. And there's, it's a surgical field for sure. And there's a table, not one I've ever seen before. It looks like a chalk outline of a human being. Literally, it's like it's a table that holds legs, torso, arms, and the head. And there's this apparatus that's holding. Just the skull. No body, nothing else. You're like, right, that makes sense. You would just pay for the head. You don't need the rest. That would be cheaper. And the doctor has explained a couple of things. And then pulls out a drill. And they drill right into the skull with a Makita. And I'm like, holy cow. But what you don't know is, is that the drill bit is a special design. The drill bit is a hole saw that's got a drill bit and a hole saw combined. A drill bit has a plunger. And the plunger is basically pressed up into the drill bit because it's pressing against hard material. But as soon as you break through the cranium, the plunger goes and it cuts the power of the drill. And the thing is, is you can feel this, but if you had a hole here and you were touching your brain, you couldn't feel that. Your brain doesn't have the same nervous system in terms of how you feel feelings in terms of physical. So then they would use a router that has a hook on it, and they could hook on the underside of the cranium, and they could just literally route around and create the pocket that they need to put the implant in. Going to a heart center to watch open heart surgery in terms of how to help surgeons improve the surgical procedure. Watching a children going through cochleostomies where they cut behind the ear and then the ear is over here. And then they're doing this strip. But in medical devices, there's at least seven layers of design. You've got the buyers, the marketers, the users, the tertiary users. You've got the people that maintain the products. You've got the parents. You've got the children. You've got the there's so many facets of design that goes into that that it can, yeah, it can be totally consumed. Um, so I'm very passionate about you guys going after what you want to do, not what you feel like you have to do. Do what you feel like you have to do to get a job, earn some money, build your curriculum to pay, but then practice informative interviews. Practice your own pyramid scheme or your marketing Get phone numbers, get names, okay, and keep working at it. You guys get people that come in these doors, oftentimes 70% of them are alums, okay, and they work at a lot of the firms that are kind of local to this area, you know. Um, they know the score, they know the drill. They're probably like minded in terms of opening the door. You guys.
guys typically fit, a, you're a certain peg that fits a certain hole, okay? I get in it, portfolios from Savannah, from Art Center, from places in Europe, from places in the Middle East, Asia, you know, they're all different shaped pegs. Don't be offended when they say no, because that program manager is looking for a certain peg to fit a certain spot. And the question is, how badly do you want to morph to fit that slot? Versus, nope, I'm an infinity shape. I'm only going to fit those slots. Go, do it. But make sure you're networking in that space of those slots. Okay? Anybody have any questions for me? Or